When I was a little girl, I dreamt all the time. Some of my dreams were repetitive and scary, while some were visions of what was to come, and others, fun and colourful, awakening me with feelings of excitement and inspiration. Many of my dreams came true and so many unexpected things happened that over time I learned an unseeming dream could become a treasure or a nightmare in real life. As mentioned in the previous episode, when I was a young girl, my family migrated back to their home country of Jamaica and we lived with my grandparents in Porus, Manchester. I lived with my grandparents and family for about a year before my parents found their own home when I was about six years old. One morning, we awoke to discover my grandmother's two goats had been stolen, the mother and the kid. I remember my whole family pouring out of the house to look at the empty goat pen. And after searching the land, my grandmother's eyes filling with tears as she spoke about how damn teeth people in the area were. It hit me so deeply to see my eldest mother crying and I immediately told her who had stolen the goats. It was Dion and his friend mama, I said. I don't know how, but I knew this to be the case. Mama was not impressed with me and she harshly told me to hush my little mouth. I figured she was too upset to listen and I remarked to myself about how silly adults could be. They all kept trying to figure out who had stolen the goats when I had already told them. This made no sense to me, but they thought they had more sense than I did. Funnily enough, the next day, Mama came and put her hand on my shoulder and she told me they had discovered the goat thieves and they turned out to be Dion and his friend, the exact two men I had named. These kinds of events happened more frequently over the years. I picked up energies from people and couldn't explain the feelings I got about them, but I trusted those feelings. I would have visionary dreaming chapters and times where I would stumble across major secrets that were supposed to be concealed from the adults, much less the children. When I was in sixth grade, I stumbled upon a family secret that was bigger than my age and understanding. I had attended a local football match where I saw my twin cousins. One was dark-skinned and the other was light-skinned and so they were nicknamed Blackie and Whitey. They were around the same age as me and were wearing pretty matching dresses which I openly admired. They told me that my brother's mother had bought the dresses as a gift and knowing that my mother regularly bought and sewed several of the same outfit and shared them amongst the girl children that she knew, I wondered aloud why I hadn't received one myself. They said it wasn't my mother, but my brother's mother who had gifted the dresses, and I remember reminding them that my brother and I had the same mother, feeling even more confused. My twin cousins then explained that it wasn't my big brother's mother who they were speaking of, but rather, a baby brother who had recently been born and visited from England. I finally realized that the twins were telling me that my father had another child that I had never heard of. Feeling emotionally overwhelmed, I left early and went straight home to speak to my mother. I told her that my father had another child. I had a special relationship with him and this was very disturbing. I often reflect on this situation and consider that if I were only a few years older, I may have kept it to myself in order to protect my mother from the heartbreak that was to come. When I told my mother what I heard, she screamed, what? She grabbed her car keys and jumped into the car, sped up the road with her tires screeching. She came back about 20 minutes later, cursing and shouting. It appeared she had some friends that she decided had to have known that my father was cheating on her. This took over for months and one night I fell asleep journaling about how happy I was to finally have a little brother but how disappointed I was in my father for hurting my mother. The next day I was awoken by a mucus shifting cough 
that I knew belonged only to him and I realized that I was picking up his energy as he traveled into the island to face my mother. All hell broke loose. In a few months, my mother and I made a trip to the UK in what was the only visit made to London while I was living in Jamaica. As my mother went visiting her friends and mutual friends she had with my father, she was met with the same story. Everyone thought that my father was no longer with my mother as he had introduced this new woman to everyone in their communities and they were all shocked to see that my mother was in total ignorance of what turned out to be a marriage to a woman from our hometown, Mandeville, who eventually had a son. My father knew that a child would reveal his transgression. Years later, I discovered that he had starved and abused his own wife throughout her pregnancy in the hopes that she would lose her child. My baby brother, however, was destined to make it and was fortunately born healthy and well. I used to think this was the reason my parents had split up, but as relationships go, they have conflicting stories. My mother always says it was down to my father's infidelity, while my father says that it was because his last drug shipment went bust and he had no more big money coming in. It makes sense that they had stayed together, as I remember the person who had to decide their fate was 10 year old me. My parents gave me the task of deciding if they should stay together, even though I was their youngest child. My brother threatened me before I made my decision and he and my mother complained for years after. In their eyes, it was my fault that my parents stayed together because of how much I, loved my dad. I was too young to understand how sick and abusive this scenario was. To ask an innocent child who has already discovered that her father is cheating on her mother to decide whether they stay together. I mean, what kind of nonsense is that? It is child abuse. If a child is too young to have a relationship, they are also too young to decide on the fate of anyone else's relationship. Either way, my father seemed to still be back and forth for the next few years and with his health declining and regular fights with my mother. Starting at around 10 years old, I started to have a series of dreams that would come every Thursday night. Once I saw a man who had died on a countryside road beside a big truck and the next week my cousin died while driving a truck on the old Melrose Hill a notoriously winding and cliff-hanging road that stretched between Williamsfield and Porus. The next week, I dreamt my mother's best friend's husband lying dead on a road somewhere, and a few days later, he was assassinated with a single gunshot to the head. I would usually tell my mother each morning after I had a dream, as was the tradition in our household. My parents, myself, and sometimes even my elder brother, all dreamt vividly. The most fascinating part being that we would often dream things that would manifest quite quickly, and on more than one occasion, we dreamt for each other, not just ourselves. Either way, my father seemed to still be back and forth for the next few years, and with his health declining, my father also often had prophetic dreams. In fact, he is known to his friends as the one person you do not want to dream about to you, as death would be coming for sure. I would hear him dreaming and cursing in his sleep, long colourful Jamaican expletives that were supposed to chase the duppies away. In Jamaica, a duppy is a ghost. And my father believed that by swearing and cursing, in the presence of negative energies, it would help to free him from their control. As bad as my father was sometimes, I felt that we had a super special connection. I may have looked like his mother, as I sensed that my words carried a lot of weight with him, and sometimes he couldn't deal with my direct gaze. My brother and my mother always teased me about how much I loved my dad, and they often called me a traitor 
for loving him through thick and thin. I had started Manchester High School, and one morning as I was preparing to go to school, my father came to me and asked me to talk with him about something. He took me into his walk-in closet and gave me hundreds of thousands of Jamaican dollars that were wrapped in coils. He was acting very shifty, and I suspected fully. Linnea, he said, I'm giving you this money to pay for my funeral. I am going to die. My comprehension was delayed, and upon realizing what he was saying, I began to feel weak, disgusted, and angry. Why was my father asking me to take care of his funeral when I was the youngest of his three children? I was only 12 years old. I refused to take the money and told him to go and ask my older brother or his first daughter in the UK to deal with it. I did not think he was being fair at all. I left the house and went off to school for the day. In the evening, after school was finished and the sun was setting on our house for the night, I was busying myself around my bedroom when I heard my mother screaming from the carport at the back of our house. She was shrieking and screaming for my brother, who by this time had grown taller than both of our parents, to come quickly and to help her. Feeling scared, I ran outside to see what was happening and I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that my father had attempted suicide and was hanging from the embers of the porch roof with a rope wrapped around his neck. My mother was holding his legs up while my brother ran out and followed her instructions to cut the rope. It turned out my mother was cooking and had walked outside to the bin to see my father hanging from the roof. This was one of many moments in my family where it was a bit too cinematic to be real. It was a bit too much to digest. My father started to crumble as a man as I hit my teenage years but my family had no idea what was behind this demise. We would find out many years later. A few years after this, my father's health started to fail him. He went back to the UK and was admitted into hospital for a thyroid issue, so my mother went to visit him. He had a restaurant in Mandeville that was run in his absence, and now that he was sick, it had been sold. I stayed between my grandparents' house in Chorus and my mother's best friend's house in Mandeville. During this period, I spent many evenings and weekends late at my high school as I was in a drama group called Ayayda Young Theatre Players that was run by a teacher called Mrs Kalai, who I will speak more about in the next episode. One night, when I was 13, I stayed at Manchester High until it was dark and ended up going to my own house to stay with one of the girls also in the Ayayde drama group. We had to go back early the next morning and she had come to stay the night. My brother woke us up in the wee hours of the night and proceeded to sexually assault my friend after giving both of us Coca-Cola laced with Ray and nephew rum. I had never drank before. And I must say, that was a terrible introduction to alcohol. I woke up the next day on the other side of the house with my friend gone and my door locked. Years later, I learned that my neighbour, who was older than my brother, had come to the house and put me in the guest room as he could see that these boys who had no supervision were going to act like they also had no morals. He did admit that as I had thought, my brother had sexually assaulted my school friend in our parents' bedroom. I never saw her again. She left the drama group and even in the days when everyone was reuniting on social media, I never saw her. To add to this, 10 years after I had left Jamaica for good, I ran into my brother's ex-girlfriend in our local town, Mandeville. I remember being shocked out of this world when she told me that if she ever saw my brother burning on fire, she wouldn't even spit on him. I had never heard this saying and couldn't understand why she would speak so poorly of him. It turned out that the same neighbour I spoke about earlier had also saved my brother's ex-girlfriend from being gang raped by my brother and his friends when they were still in a relationship. My brother, like many Jamaican men, had sexually assaulted two women that I knew of myself. 
it was horrific and repulsive to me, especially knowing that if it wasn't for our neighbor, my brother would have allowed his nasty friend to sexually assault me. Within this year, there was no improvement with my father's health and swift plans were made for the family's return to London. When my family migrated back to the UK, it felt like a sad day indeed. London seemed so boring in comparison to Jamaica, especially on fun days like Christmas Eve that would see Jamaica host an island-wide party called Grand Market and other public holidays. We lived in my parents' home in Enfield and my father lived in West London. Most annoyingly, he would turn up regularly at the most random hours of the night. He would sit on the loud doorbell when finally allowed in and he would behave like a madman throughout the whole night, often sleeping throughout the entire next day. Unknown to my mother, I eventually came to discover from an in-law that my father had become addicted to a drug called crack and once again, I let her in on what I knew. Needless to say, the effects were devastating as we had to try to understand an addiction we had no knowledge of, having lived in the Jamaican countryside for so long. In addition to this, I was seeing my mother in a brand new light. When I eventually told her what my brother had done to my friend and had intended for me, she vowed to keep it secret. And then the next day when I returned home from school, she greeted me by calling me a lying little bitch and said my brother said it was not true and she believed him. Like many Jamaican mothers do when they are told their sons are sexual offenders, she denied it and she broke my trust. This was the last straw for me as my mother had also refused to believe me back in Jamaica when my brother's best friend had stuck his nasty, dirty, long tongue down my 12-year-old throat without permission. I knew that when he saw her deny it, he was waiting for the day when being older and trickier than me, he would eventually take advantage. You see, the one thing I was old enough to learn before I left Jamaica at 14 years old is how absolutely perverse and nasty men could be, especially within this culture. It was a regular occurrence as an 11 year old girl going to school wearing a uniform that covered the entire hip region to be told by adult men that my pussy was fat. This is the experience of most underage girls in Jamaica, as paedophilic and perverse as the culture is. It was normal to be apprehended by a or a man would hiss through his teeth and say the most lewd and degrading things to a girl who wasn't even old enough to legally have sex. One of my father's staff members, who worked in his Mandeville restaurant, had got his own underage daughter pregnant. He lost his job, but he had his freedom, which was crazy to me. This is a big detriment within our toxic culture. And I don't know if it was because my brother saw my father being abusive to my mother since he was young. It was clear that he had seen more than I had as he was four years older. But being over six foot tall, he felt that it was appropriate to hit and attack me too often for my liking. And I ran away at 15 to get away from the hell of it all. I was spicy, I was feisty, and it wasn't too far-fetched for me to imagine stabbing his guts out with my 15-year-old rage. So before that occurred, I left. For years, I always thought that I left home because of my violent brother. But as I matured and entered womanhood, I realized that I had left home because my mother failed to establish healthy boundaries in her home. And my brother, who was supporting her financially at the time and still does up until today, was of too much monetary value to her now that my father was drug dependent. My brother became my mother's replacement husband. So I put myself in foster care, as the thought of staying with my mother's beast of a sister, mentioned in episode two, was worse than going to strangers. And this was how at 15, I started to forge a new path for myself, seeking to heal from the known traumas and on my way for more to be unveiled over the years. When I was a child, I felt like my family was my root and my strength. Now they were a heavy load I carried on my back. 
When I went into state care, I immediately attended college and I started teaching professionally at 19 years old. I was able to share creativity with ease and it opened doors for me to attend university and drama school. I tried for many years to take care of the relationship with my mother, but her ongoing refusal to acknowledge the transgressions of my brother would eventually force me away. After many years and mothering a daughter of my own, I became sure of my conviction that the issues in my family were not unique to me but many were cultural issues that I have found in so many women and men in my culture. Unfortunately, the issue of my mother denying sexual assaults committed by her own son proved to be closer to home than I would realise and many years later, my favourite drama teacher, a victim of Jamaican culture just like my mother, would commit the same vile, socially conditioned and spineless act. That's for episode 5. Before I go, I would like to share that I created the first three episodes of Life After Death for my EFA clients, for the people who come to me to get ancestral guidance, wisdom and healing. I have found that the stories from the first three episodes are stories that I've had to tell so many times and I recently decided to make some short videos about them so I could share with ease. I had no idea that Life After Death would turn out to be a much more personal, fierce, and unapologetic sharing and I am thankful for everyone who has joined me so far. In the next episode I will speak about my favourite drama teacher Juliet Kalai and her son a serial rapist. I will speak about the things I have experienced as a result of interacting with her. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please like, comment and subscribe if you haven't already. A big shout out to the Belly fam. Thank you so much for watching the videos you have watched so far. I really appreciate it. As always, it's been a pleasure sharing with you from the base of my soul. And until the next time, as the old timers would say, what good?